It's my privilege this afternoon to introduce my good friend, Michael Neymark, uh, who's responsible for a lot of the work that you're going to see. Um, he's been in the city digitizing business uh, for about 30 years when he worked on the Aspen Project. And since that time, he's digitized things with uh, various apparatus, including a backpack, um, from Angkor to Timbuktu. And he's now on the faculty of USC's Interactive Media Studies program. Michael Neymark. Thank you very much. Now, are we, am I going to have to hold this? I don't need this because you're miking me. Good. I don't need to turn this off either. OK. Yeah, sorry about the AV stuff. You'd think we'd be better by now. Um, thank you, Lance. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with you and uh, to be here at uh, Google presenting this kind of crazy project that we've been doing for the past um, five months intensively. It really is a collaborative project uh, between uh, the primarily scientists and engineers at the Institute for Creative Technologies and more um, art, artists and designers in the film school, basically, Interactive Media Division. Um, my old boss at Interval Research, uh, David Liddell, used to joke that, you know how you get artists, designers, and computer scientists to work together? You put them in the same building. Um, and it turns out that we had pizza lunches every Friday, and it helped. We just, it was a cultural thing that I, I hope you all appreciate, uh, just getting to know each other's priorities and languages and things like that. Um, this was also, um, of course, produced with the support of a Google Research Award. I'd like to thank Jeff Walsh and uh, John Hankey uh, for that opportunity. Um, when I had a meeting here a while ago, and I had a very short amount of time, and I didn't want to introduce myself through the normal bio, um, I thought I put together a, quote, feeling lucky list. And they said, what's that? And I said, you know, when, you are number, when your stuff is number one on uh, uh, Google searches. And they said, never heard of that before. So um, uh, the, the one that's not on here now is that if you Google feeling lucky list, it's also number one for the work I do. But I do think that this is sort of a more sincere and less egocentric uh, alternative to sort of you know, bios and stuff. Um, viewfinder is a novel method for users to spatially situate or find the pose of their photographs and then to view these photographs along with others as perfectly aligned overlays in a 3D world model such as Google Earth. Our objective is to provide a straightforward procedure for geolocating photos of any kind and our approach is to engage a community of users for a little bit of human help. Two big points here, any kind, human help. We specify that a 10-year-old should be able to find the pose of a photo in less than a minute. We're convinced this goal is possible. Um, early on, um, one of our colleagues, Will Carter, was walking through his uh, bank parking lot in the Atwater District of LA. And I don't know what compelled him to do this, but he went down and took a picture of the parking lot with his foot in it. Now, he did know that this area is pretty high res in Google Earth. And I don't know why. I think this is an absolutely amazing cosmic photo, that there's something going on here that's very, very difficult to explain, that um, it's, it's an alignment between something shot very high up, if not in a satellite, certainly in a, a high res airplane, uh, posed with something very personal and so eccentric that we don't even know why he would have done this. Uh, so I, I used to, years ago, ask audiences, uh, and particularly the art and technology world, um, have you thought about, after you die, if you've decided n to be buried, where that location would be? Now, I'll spare the embarrassment here, but I've done that to a bunch of audiences. And what always happens is some percentage of hands shoot up. There's no hesitation. And you know, I can look around the room. You know, some of you are sort of nodding. US is a much lower percentage than Europe and whatnot. But the point is that place runs deep. And there's a statistic that I'm going to blow, but you'll get the idea. It's something like prior to 100 years ago, something like 98% of everyone on the planet never ventured more than 60 miles from the place they were born in their entire life. So this resonance, and one could even say magic, that we associate with, with place is a very deep one. And w one of my favorite little applications, uh, obscure area, uh, but it's made 
Wikipedia's we photography. And the photos here kind of don't do justice the magic of being able to actually see them overlaid. And you know it when they're like dead on, right? Um, one that I do want to uh, show down at the bottom, uh, the third view, um, are some people that have been rephotographing um, now in a third sequence. And I, I've heard these guys talk. And I can assure you, these guys don't know pose from beans. They, they've never heard of sift or ransack. Or, uh, you know, they wear hiking boots all the time. And uh, they go out there, and they just have developed. It's hard you know, to know when to move laterally versus when to pan your camera, when to zoom versus when to dolly in. Um, but one can develop an intuition for doing this. And if you think that these are the sort of people that might have, you know, worked it a little bit in Photoshop, I really don't think so. They're very pure um, about what they're doing. Um, another example, similar, is what happens when you uh, uh, spray paint a living room white after filming it and then uh, project the film back on uh, uh, the white painted objects, except the people, of course. So this was an installation at the Art Center College of Design in uh, 2005. And you can see, firstly, a lot of artifacts that it, it's not always working. But I, I hope you can see at least that what's going on is when the reprojection is properly posed with the background physical uh, geometry, um, things work. You, you get that magic. So the basics of how we began um, really was around finding the pose of photographs with respect to a 3D model um, and a little bit of human help. And uh, forgive me in advance, I'll be talking more in maybe cinematography terms than computer science terms. So I'm not going to talk about intrinsic and extrinsic camera parameters as much as what's used in, for example, the special effects industry. So um, yes, we know that there are more parameters needed and deep in the special effects industry where they know that glass is very analog. They'll do incredible extremes to sort of match lenses and get you know, the fundamentals of the optics of a particular lens uh, to match with 3D graphics in terms of posing. But for our purposes, um, these eight parameters are pretty much enough. And um, how, how accurate to get that magic of rephotography or reprojecting as a starting point, we're saying laterally about a meter and angularly about a degree. Now, if you're shooting Mount Rushmore, the lateral tolerances for rephotography or posing is going to be really different than standing in front of the ferry building. The angular won't be, but just to give an idea. Uh, consumer technologies are off by um, uh, not quite an order of magnitude about an order of magnitude. And going in the other direction, the motion control, the special effects world, has much, much, much tighter tolerances. So for the sort of things that we're interested in doing, it falls somewhere in between uh, cheap consumer tech and very, very expensive Hollywood uh, technology. Um, related work, uh, I got to admit, this has been a uh, little obsession. So indulge me in kind of a story. I heard about witness point tracking probably 20 years ago. Um, something about putting tennis balls in a scene and then garbage matting them out, uh, making sure that they were non-coplanar at known relationships from each other. Um, about 10 or 12 years ago, I remember having a conversation with Glenn Entis, who's now at Electronic Arts, but back then he was at Pacific Data PDI, right? Um, and he was saying that they had developed a system for putting a thing in the frame. And he wouldn't tell me exactly what it looked like, but it, the way he waved his hands, it sounded like a large tinker toy you know, kind of thing that they would garbage mat out. And the phrase, this is way before match moving, which is now a deal in Hollywood, uh, the phrase witness point tracking was used. So I was 
bewildered before our project to find only five hits. And other than the, uh, the blue ones that all refer to as some obscure thing, the bottom one is a uh, uh, bio for Brad de Graaff in German uh, for Ars Electronica in Linz 1988. Um, and the middle one uh, goes to a uh, uh, paper by Gary Demos that um, you can get the PDF, but it's not on searchable easily on Google. Indeed, in 1977, uh, for Close Encounters, working with Vilmos Zygmunt Spielberg and Doug Trumbull, they uh, did a test using four-inch light bulbs uh, that they put through. And they pretty much proved that it could work. And of course, there is human intervention in something like this. Um, but they didn't get the contract. Doug Trumbull had, the year or two earlier, developed this absolutely incredible instrumented motion control camera that had all of these parameters very precisely uh, sensed. Um, and if you look at match moving today, I don't know if you can read the bottom, uh, the first and some of the best examples of match moving were used in the film Jurassic Park, colored tennis balls, uh, 1993. This is clearly incorrect, and I hope uh, that our paper and research might get this fixed. The guy who did this, Mel McMahon, uh, turned 81 uh, in February and was helpful with this. Um, related work, movie maps. I have a lot to say about movie maps. Um, uh, I humbly uh, can say that I don't think anyone has put more camera contraptions and shot more places over more years. I don't even know who's number two. Um, but in, in terms of this context, um, a lot of it has to do with the relationship between the interval that you're shooting, um, uh, what kind of transition you use from one to the other. It's all lookup, right? Um, and, and how smooth this is. So to me, the magic question for any form of movie map, whether it's Aspen or Street View, is how credible are the in-between frames? What are they there for? Uh, street view, now take a look. I don't have to say this to you all. Um, but this is a, a, a combination dissolve and scale. And um, does it help the eye adjust? Well, I suppose it does. Um, but are any of the in-between frames usable on their own? Uh, no. Um, every scape does something more interesting. Um, and the interval, therefore, seems to be greater because they can do these longer transitions. But I would still challenge anyone to uh, uh, answer the question, are any of these in-betweens usable? Photosynth, um, as you all know, it's a point cloud based. Uh, it also has the transition issue uh, going from one frame to another. So there's no underlying model behind it. But the more significant difference between it and our intention deals with what gets ransacked. So in their paper, and again, I apologize. I'm not sure how much you can read this. But when they did their automated searches using Flickr, um, for example, for Notre Dame and Paris, um, they got 2,635 photos, of which 597 um, uh, made it as inliers, um, 325 out of 1882, and so on. It's about 22%. And we very, very, very strongly feel that our little contribution in this world is to emphasize creativity driving technology rather than the other way around. And I think that's why we were so mesmerized by my colleague Will Carter's picture of his feet in the parking lot. Um, Panoramio, of course you all know about. Uh, what fascinates us is how um, Panoramio does by editorial fiat what uh, Photosynth does by technological limitations. And um, again, the, the, I have nothing against you know, no people posing, cars, planes, pets, flowers, close-ups, underwater and events. Um, but if this were applied to Flickr, you'd still have a bunch of good images. You'd have only 1% of what you started with. Um, we have been tracking uh, Panoramio images 
uh, entering Google Earth because in uh, July, uh, I can barely read this, there's 1.2 million, and in February, there's 4.5 million, presumably selected by hand because of the editorial policy. Somebody's working pretty hard over there, looking at a lot of pictures. Um, we noticed shortly after our project started that um, the gigapixel images um, looked really nice <laughs> uh, in terms of how they were positioned and you know, assumed that this is not a coincidence, that this just happens to be perfectly posed, very nicely posed. And this is uh, leaving the pose. Uh, Flickr, um, I went to Internet Archive just for fun, and uh, this was the first home page in, I think, 2004 for Flickr, and I also found on the Internet Archive um, a charming little um, blog post by Katerina, one of the co-founders. This is what, uh, June, July, August, uh, three months after Flickr started. Uh, that she found uh, four lovely tags, graffiti, rust, neon, and frog, frog. Okay. Today, frog has over 100,000 hits on Flickr, and Flickr, uh, according to Wikipedia uh, itself, has more than 2 billion images on it. So what does that tell us, at the risk of being a little presumptuous? Google Earth has posed several hundred photos, has potentially 4.5 million uh, more geolocated photos to go. Uh, Photosynthesis is impressive, um, uh, but it has uh, uh, problems with no underlying 3D model, um, and most importantly, it's uh, low success rate at handling arbitrary photos. And Yahoo is this crazy free-for-all database um, where something's going on in terms of um, community involvement. Um, so our approach is, uh, first and foremost, that we can deal with any and all photos. Number two, that we use a little bit of human help, and you probably know the word phrase crowdsourcing. Um, and that we're not saying this is an end-all solution. We do want cameras to have good GPS in the future. We do want cameras to have accurate angular sensors. And we do want vision technologies to be able to make virtually all of this automated but it's not there yet. And the cost for that having, the, the cost for doing it right now is snipping off the creativity, and that's what we're trying not to do. So we developed two solutions for pose finding that both begin with the first step. We didn't know what to call it, so we just referred to it as step one. It's basically like Panoramio, it's putting a dot on the map. Um, anecdotally, Think about this yourself. When you look at a map, particularly tight, aerial overlay, and you think about when you actually press the trigger, anecdotally, we think that people, their memory of where they were standing without GPS is probably within a meter, depending on landmarks. Um, we're assuming human height for now, um, and we ask the user to specify a direction because the goal at the end of step one is to have your photo here and a screen grab from a 3D world model that's a rough approximation there. Um, our two solutions are what we call the 2D to 2D solution and the 2D to 3D solution. The 2D to 2D solution takes those initial position three parameters as a given and locks them down. And when you think about if I was trying, if I was standing in um, what's that inverted globe that's at the Christian Science Center in Boston, you know? And I had a projector mounted in a fixed XYZ position and an image that I wanted to correspond, it should be obvious that I could match it by panning, tilting, rotating, and zooming. It's a fundamentally 2D and clean problem and something that humans can do really pretty easy. Um, uh, the problem is that if you didn't nail that initial point uh, properly, you have to go back to go. The, 2D, the 3D solution is more in the spirit of match moving and witness point tracking. And it's a much more challenging solution, but the end game would be the 10-year-old saying, 
this point is this point, this point is this point, this point is this point, and having the stuff under the hood do the correlation. Um, so the, just put these all out. Uh, the pros for 2D to 2D is that it is computationally easy, and it's easy and intuitive for a human helper to just do the little bit of um, registering. And by the way, since it's only finding four parameters, we initially started by nailing one point and then doing a rotate scale to get things to match. Um, now our designer is more into, um, uh, you'll see in a second, but slopping around. But you know, in the end, you really only need two nonlinear points to get these four dimensions locked down. It's a pretty simple problem. Um, uh, the bad news is that the initial position must be accurate. Um, yeah. Uh, the 2D to 3D is, again, more in the spirit of computer vision and something that we're interested in um, pursuing. Um, there are a couple problems with it, though. Um, one is that the human helper will need to develop some kind of intuition about what non-coplanar means. Um, and whether that can be intuitive or not is an open question. Uh, probably yes. And then the more functional question is that we would need the cooperation of folks like you or another 3D world builder because we would need access to the Z data in order to do that. So we would have our photo here, a rough approximation screen grab here based on the initial point. Um, and when we start matching points, the Z data from the 3D model is required for the 2D to 3D um, approach. And I should also point out that um, th this is non-semantic 3D data as opposed to semantic 3D data. And Debevec and I had these long discussions about trying to like understand. So for example, I, th they had a tendency to want to go for the vertices. And I would ask, let's say you had a good model and it was photographically textured. And on the roof of the model, a tiled roof, there was a missing tile. Could I use that as a potential feature point? It's in the middle of a plane. And he said, the answer is yes. And it's just really, you know, it's, it's 2D to 3D. So it really doesn't involve semantics as much as it involves um, uh, just having access to that information. Uh, so that's pose finding, pose viewing. Um, we had to rely a lot on photo overlay. Thank you very much. We could not have done this six months ago. Um, and the place to start with viewing posed photos is the truism that if you're on the nodal point um, and the photo is posed, and let's say it's transparent, 50-50, it will always be perfectly aligned, always. Um, the image can be close and small, placed in the 3D model. It could be far and big. If it's too far, it might intersect some of the objects. We actually did a little bit of work on having it intersect prominent objects to see if that's interesting, sort of. Um, uh, it could be at a skewed angle. doesn't matter. From the nodal point, it's always, always going to uh, appear properly aligned. But just get these all out. Um, but there are some variables, and I'm calling them design variables because it's kind of a little bit a matter of taste. As I mentioned, I feel very, very strongly to only show the photo when you're on the nodal point and to use line three, some kind of non-photographic indicator when you're not on the nodal point, and uh, for that matter, to have a snap to feature. Um, let's see, Photosynth has empty frames that glow, very nice, and frustum lines, which you can turn on and off, as indicators. And then the photograph fades up as you approach it, whereas the gigapixel, gigapan images that you do are uh, persistent. And there's no indicator um, other than the image itself. Um, I don't know any way to get good at how these variables interact except to just do a lot of them. And 
for the video that I'll show you at the end, the five minute video, you'll see little examples of all of these. And again, I think that we've developed a little bit of experience in this and that there's a long way. This is a sort of a community effort in design. Um, so this is the uh, step one thing. Uh, and what's going on here is very simple. Um, you stipulate where and at what angle. And if you go a little under the hood, you can control tilt. Um, and uh, we built a fake Google Earth frame grab server using uh, the Com API. Uh, it's running in the background. It's not what we wanted to do, but we had no choice. It's a hack. Um, but what's kind of cool about this is that you stay on the ground. And that's hard to do with Google Earth <laughs> anyway. And you kind of move around and try to get um, as close an initial match between your image and the point of view. Um, and again, if you're doing a 2D to 2D solution, this is critical, uh, which is a bummer. If you're doing a 2D to 3D solution, just need to get it close. Um, the current incarnation of the 2D to 2D, and frankly, we're making more work than we have to <laughs> for, to, to do this. Um, and we don't want to sugarcoat something that no human should really have to do and try to make it fun. We want to make it uh, easy. Um, and again, you know, if you have two nonlinear, it's not nonlinear. It, if you have two points, you should be able to nail all uh, four coordinates and you're done. And the ICT people have been working on more ambitious uh, 2D to 3D approaches. There's something like 500 iterations going on uh, for every match that's made here. And of course, there's still a long way to go. Again, proof of concept only. Um, if we pursue this, the question of whether to run right now with a usable, launchable web app that's 2D to 2D that doesn't, frankly, require any you know, connection with Google. It doesn't require access to information that we don't already have. Um, or whether to uh, pursue deeper 2D to 3D solutions is something we're undecided about. Um, you know, we think if we get a 2D to 2D solution out there, that there's enough people that would pose images. The, the real research is more in the 2D to 3D. Um, as I mentioned, understanding the uh, design issue, design issues around uh, posing. When we started this project, we said there are three phases, pose finding, pose viewing, and modeling. And we haven't addressed the much larger and more important issue of how can you incorporate photographs into the actual model making process. Um, we chose to focus very narrowly, if you will, on post finding, because we know that post finding is an important step uh, in anything that you'll be possibly doing with model making. Um, John Markoff claimed that I said that we were rabble rousing. Uh, we do want to, in our own small way, have impact on companies like Google and camera companies uh, to integrate things like this to make it easier. And um, we also strongly believe that the more community engagement in the modeling process, the happier everyone's going to be. Um, let's look at the video and then be delighted to take questions. There is audio.
So on one level, what we wanted to do here was understand what the outliers were in Photosynth and what the Panoramio editorial policy was and do everything to violate both of them in the imagery here. It's also important to point out that the 3D world models like Google Earth have three different types of geometry, uh, terrain only, which is very coarse, uh, what we call shoe boxes, like all of Japan, uh, uh, untextured, and then the uh, uh, sketched up richer buildings. So we wanted to show examples from all of them. These, of course, you recognize being from Street View. So, you know, you kind of wonder whether people would pose their homes. This is from Vertigo. Thank you, and I have to emphasize that I'm really just a messenger for a very uh, eclectic and talented team. So thank you very much. Um, that's all I really have to say. And you know, we wanted to do something fast and lean and get it out there as quick as possible uh, to provoke discussion and what's next, because this really is a hot, interesting, timely area. Are there any questions? Yes? Since I got a digital camera, I never take one picture. I usually take 20 pictures. And 
and I'm, I'm not sure where I was to within one meter for any of those pictures. I know I was standing out in front of my house back and forth and took a whole bunch of pictures. Can you think of a way to use that group of pictures uh, to pose the whole group? Yeah, that's a good question. You, you know, in terms of the big, big scheme of what we're um, proposing is that humans, what we're trying to do is solve a multi-dimensional search problem. And the more we can pound constraints into this, the more manageable it is for a computational solution. Humans are not very good at solving eight-dimensional search problems, but they're good at getting it close. So it might just be that for the next couple of years, um, if you get them in the general vicinity, something like uh, uh, SIFT can help. You know, if you, if you take them at the same time and they're near each other. With the same camera. Pardon? With the same camera. With the same camera, right. Um, and I think the bigger picture is that what you're saying is what a lot of people are doing now. It's not like 35 millimeter film where, you know, you care. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I'd like to say that uh, this video is really impressive, so <laughs> thanks. And um, so I had a look at, at your web page, mm -hmm. and at some point, um, it said that you were considering to find the vanishing points of the pictures because of those pictures with lots, I mean, buildings, and you right. can have a lot of parallel lines. And I wanted to know how, uh, um, how far are you on this track, and? Um, we're, uh we want to do it. You know, it's funny because part of the healthy tension between um, uh, us from the film school and them from, you know, computer science is um, around the issue of uh, various automation schemes that might help but act as a fairly strong filtering mechanisms for what images work better than others. Um, Again, those pizza lunches have helped a lot. We all sort of get along and try to figure out and negotiate. If we're going to have um, use vanishing points, we push them to go, OK, but can you back off of like rectangular buildings only? You know, we know you can do that. Um, so we, you know, sort of iterate back and forth. Um, so that's a long answer to a, a question where the real answer is we'd like to continue. Um, in your examples of the movie, were there any uh, pictures where you didn't know the location or couldn't guess it? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, let me break that down, because mathematically, there are a whole class of pictures that have non-unique solutions. If I take a photograph of a, a, a mural on a wall, um, I could pose it along a, a non-unique line anywhere, right? Um, and then there are pictures of Devil's Tower where you could be, especially with terrain turned off, sorry about that, uh, where, where you could be off by a long, long uh, uh, way and it would still be credible. And then there are pictures like the foot in the bank parking lot um, where, you know, there are a lot of white painted lines on concrete where it really could be anywhere. Um, uh, in terms of a photograph, and I'm assuming you mean an outdoor photograph, where we have some idea where it is, but we just couldn't pose it? Well, well, I'm more talking about the case where you don't know the location where the photograph was taken, and so therefore you have to have a much uh, bigger solver problem. I mean, you have to solve yeah, for more yeah, parameters. We, um, we have not been dealing with that. If, if you have a picture of a, you know, a tri-level green and orange home with trim, you know, lawn in front of it and a, uh, 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 you know, Lexus hybrid and, you know, I, I, no, we, we have not been dealing with that. Question. No, I'm actually, sorry, I'm not making myself clear. Okay. I was more thinking of where you can't put that initial dot on the map. I mean, basically, you know you were there, but you can't localize it enough. Like the aerial photo in the Yeah, the like, <laughs> exactly. How does the user get started with a picture? Like that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, 
they started uh, with the runways, and that's actually an interesting one because I, that was a certain amount of witchcraft, you know, uh, to pose that one. Also, when you look carefully at the video, and of course it's on YouTube, um, the poses are far from perfect, and if you get the foreground right, it's a lot better than getting the foreground wrong and the background right. So, you know, we know at least where to start in terms of making it look good. Um, but if what you're asking is a little bit like what you're asking, you're at uh, Golden Gate Park, or you know, you're walking around the ferry building, you took a ton of pictures, and um, you look at this and you go, well, you know, it's kind of pointing toward the Bay Bridge, and part of the ferry building's in the foreground, and I don't, you know, it's somewhere around here. This is why the 2D to the 2D to 3D solution would fix that. It would be an adaptive system by which all you need is enough non-coplanar feature overlap between your photo and a 3D model, and as you match points, and it could be a broken tile on a roof, non-semantic, but 3D points, it would just automatically adjust. So that, that's really the more interesting approach. And the answer to your question is if, if you can get it in the ballpark and you have an adaptive Post finding human, you know. Okay. Yes, you're absolutely right. And then it only f um, fails in absence of good 3D data. And so that was the Correct. follow up question. Correct. How do you deal with inconsistent 3D data, old 3D data, or silhouette edges where you can't really localize points, but um, you basically have to guess? How do you deal with, let's say that I live in a neighborhood of currently shoe boxes in my neighborhood, you know, in LA. Uh, but I really want to pose a picture that I took, so I'm confronted with taking my photograph and matching it up on a rectilinear surface, which is a little bit like step one in SketchUp, right? Um, can I find a best match for that that's satisfactory? Well, kind of. Um, Sure, we secretly hope that through the massive accumulation of posed photographs, this is valuable information that can be used to refine the models, which are far from perfect right now. Yes? We can also talk about the posing video. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question was about posing video. <laughs> um, well, we've certainly thought a lot about it, and there is that one. Um, camera on tripod three progressive image to show a little bit of motion that's in our video, uh, in our demo video. Um, the nice thing about video is that if you pose the first frame, you know, if you pose the nth frame, the nth plus oneth frame is so similar that that should be able to be done computationally, right? Um, so it doesn't seem like that hard a problem. There's a lot of problems with storage and retrieval. We just think that if we can get some tools like this out there, to me a metric of success is I want to see surprises. I want to see people doing stuff creatively that's going to make us all like wake up and go, wow, I never thought of that before. Yes? So uh, the photo overlay tag was very handy for this. What uh, one or two features would you add to Google Earth to uh, to make people pose more photos or oh. to make this easy? Thank you. That's thank you for asking. Um, control of uh, field of view for photo overlay. Um, control of transparency. I mean, you guys know that we did a lot of um, uh, uh, After Effects and stuff to you know artificially make dissolves happen that, didn't, that don't happen in photo overlay right now. Um, I, I don't, yeah, have, pardon? I think we do have field of view. Um, controllable? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I apologize. No, no, no. Um, and, and that's accessible? I mean, we can find it? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a question, a related question that deals with um, whether we, and it, meaning the community, meaning including Photosynth and everyone, can agree on some posing protocol. So 
I don't know how whoever's posing gigapixel, gigapan images are determining how big the virtual photograph should be, how far back from the nodal point. And I equally haven't a clue when you go in Photosynth where you see lots of glowing rectangles. It's clear that they're all normalized so that whatever they're doing to one, they're doing to all the rest. But I haven't any sense uh, what that is. I mean, can you just, you know, you can think, well, okay, well, how, let's find the first solid object and go midway between. But, you know, where in the frame? Um, uh, and again, I don't know how Photosynth does, does this at all, but if we can agree on protocols, that makes the whole posing, pose viewing process a lot, lot easier for everyone. A bit of a general question. It seems that a lot of your best demos were when you actually have the, all the 3D models in the region available, and you know, and sometimes most of the Earth you don't have 3D models available, right? And if you want this thing to really be global, like you need to do something, I mean, pictures to pictures alignment, or like what do you do then, right? Yeah. I mean, that's maybe not satisfactory because then you're in photosynth world. So then you just maybe wait for people to release 3D models of everything before you place it, or. I think that what we're doing at its best is contributing a small piece to a very, very big problem. And the big problem is modeling out the world, and um, uh, which clearly does need some level of community help. And um, I, I, yeah, we've, we've always sort of been against the photo to photo thing. We've always been assuming that our thing is about photo to model posing photos with respect to models, not photos with respect to other photos. Um, and we've speculated, so what happens if you're standing in the middle of the Sahara Desert where there's not a feature other than brown plain and you pose a photo? Um, it's a good question. Uh, oh, part of the answer is, okay, there's photo to photo like photosynth, but there's also photos to model, which we, which that's the other thing for uh, photo overlay is the ability to um, not only see the multiple photos, which you can do now more or less, but to have some kind of snap to or other means of like photosynth traveling from one to the other. So you're in the middle, Darfur is a great example because you guys have been doing work there. Um, so what you might have in Darfur um, uh, initially are a bunch of photos posed with respect to each other on the model, and the model's flat, and the minute somebody puts a little shoebox there, you have an anchor to start building out more. I, I don't know how else to begin. One alternative is to have these, uh, you know, point clouds, the sparse ones, and try to align things to them, right? Mm -hmm. Have you tried that as an alternative to actual 3D models and how much worse it is? We haven't done anything with uh, SIFT and point clouds at all. And um, I have a lot of respect for how Microsoft has been dealing with that. And um, you can try to do the manual solution to 3D point cloud world, right, and try to do some kind of robust matching in that sense where it, point clouds can be more wrong. It's not as good as the 3D model, but still there's 3D information, right? And, and, and frankly, you know, we're assuming that there's so much activity going on in that area um, between, you know, the CVPR and the 3D PVT communities and whatnot um, uh, that we're, we're sort of positioning our role, maybe it is rabble rousing as, um, not so much what does it take to build out the world in models, but what does it take to get the broadest diversity of photos somehow integrated? That's our niche. Yes? Um, this is mostly a user interface problem, if I see that correctly. And have you looked at other paradigms to place pictures of other kinds? Like, let's say the Sahara picture, you see the horizon. So in that case, did you think of special tools for horizons or indoor scenes or um, things like that? Um, that's a good question. And um, 
uh, as someone who has sometimes very unsuccessfully tried to project uh, images on white painted, you know, volumes, um, th there are sort of heuristics that you can use to some extent. But no, th that's a very good question, how to um, make the UI easier. And, you know, again, I, it, we think that if we get something out there, uh, that there's enough of a community. Again, you look at the numbers with Flickr, and you look at the number of people doing historical photographs, you know, and re-photography. Um, my, my experience with UI is that it's extremely counterintuitive. And every time I think I, that's the right answer, I'm like so wrong. Uh, so the lesson for me is you really just have to test, test, test. But you think there is a single solution, sort of? I don't know. You know. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, again, in a perfect world, I suppose there wouldn't be any human interaction. You take a picture, and it would end up uh, in a model. And in a less than perfect world, you'd want um, uh, something that is like no more labor intensive than what people do for Flickr right now. But by the way, one other little point on that, um, and again, with, with no disrespect to Photosynth, taking Flickr images by the batch is not the way the Flickr community works, um, where, where you have a vested interest in ownership, picture by picture, in tagging it and sharing it, and if you have to do a minute's worth of other stuff, um, and there's some satisfaction, because all of a sudden, like, click, it locks, you know, you get a little payback that doesn't seem so bad. Yes? I think in, <clears throat> instead of thinking this is a problem where in the perfect world it would all be automated, I think uh, you should always think that no matter how great your computer vision is, it's going to have failure cases. There's going to be that guy holding up the picture of war in Iraq, right, and there's right. going to be like a little tiny sliver of the picture that, right. that you want to place, and everything else doesn't fit. Right. There's always going to be cases that don't work. Right. And so you want to start with a manual system that you always fall back to when it doesn't work, and then it becomes a problem of just how to make the manual system more helpful, uh, mm -hmm. or, or the, the, the automatic tools in there, like a horizon finder or a, or a you know, parallel line detector or something like that assist you. And if you can have it snap to, and you know, as soon as the computer understands the picture well enough, you know, he, he you know, resolves all 11 parameters perfectly, right. um, that would be helpful. But uh, underneath it all, you always have to have a great UI to let the people fix the problems when it doesn't work. You have I to agree. have a, it, it needs to be quick, you know, small cycle time, so you don't have to wait a minute for it to calculate. And you need to be able to you know, hit escape or something. Undo that back up and try again. You know, let me give you yeah. one more hint and see if you can get it right this time. You know I that? totally agree. And again, I w without any hint of denigration, self-denigration here, how can I put this? Um, we don't see this as some big thing that we're ready to hype as being slices, dices, change the world as much as focusing on a very particular piece of the puzzle. And I want to be careful with my words here, because I don't want to hype it too much, because it is a transitionary state. And I do think that if we can get something out there like this, um, and, and I see the need you know, on a bunch of levels and the timeliness, that a year from now and two years from now, we'll have learned so much because of community involvement that um, then we can sort of reconsider mm -hmm. what the next step is. Because the, the really, really big issues are huge issues. By the way, you know, maybe the hugest, hu hugest issue of all is that the difference between Earth models and fictitious models like Second Life and Warcraft is that for every X, Y, Z, and T, there's a ground truth. And without getting into postmodernist rhetoric about what is reality, um, for any given x, y, or, or Rashomon, well, that's I saw something else. And you, If I had a camera and you had a camera and we took a picture 
aimed at the same place at the same time, we're going to get the same thing. And what that means is that all Earth models are aggregatable. <laughs> and I don't know if you folks here are considering this, but that's a huge, the implications behind what that means. I mean, right now there's a website you can go to and it aggregates because you can sort of like link from one to the other. But um, it's a unique property of the real world that doesn't exist in fictitious worlds. And Lance is smiling on this one. <laughs> Getting back on your objectives, you were saying that you want, you would like to uh, tenure being able to correctly pose the photo in a minute or so. So I wanted to know in, with this uh, because right now you're using the 2D to 2D interface to pose on, uh, yeah, in Google Earth. So what is the average time to do that successfully? And have you test with a random user? I mean, some kind of usability test? And um, no, no, we haven't tested with random users, and we're certainly not ready for prime time. I will say that. Um, Will Carter and uh, Eric Lawyer, who are the two contractors that have been doing most of the post finding, um, in the past three months have increased their speed by probably a factor of five. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, that step one interface is now really pretty quick. So that, that, that's probably a minute right there. Okay. And then. Um, the question of registering from there is probably about five minutes if it's an easy one. So, so right now you can move horizontally like that and vertically the angle with the yes, and I think that you can rotate, but you have to go a little deeper. It's not okay. like an easy interface. Um, similarly, you can change the height for step one for your X Y Z position, but it's not a clear and easy okay. thing to do. Pardon? Could you do with a corner pin, assuming it's on geometry, like you know that there is a vertical wall of a building, just a corner pin? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, we we want to be careful not to reinvent SketchUp. I mean, you know, we we could come up with two dozen easy to use features uh, that, that deal with vanishing points and uh, assumptions about edges and corners. Um, uh, we're seeing how far and fast and harder we can run with a very simple idea, and that's why we're keeping focused on the 10-year-old one-minute thing, you know. Good, good questions, everyone. <laughs>